Well, good evening, class, and welcome to tonight's um, edition of our project management. We stopped at, um, we finished, um, um, what is it? Um, scope management. Okay scope management so this night we are starting with um, stakeholder management so that's what we'll be doing tonight uh, it's a very big topic on its own so let's start So we're in um, stakeholder management. Stakeholder is anybody that have a stake in a project, whether as um, a user of that project, of that um, the end uh, result of that project, whether you are working as a um, subject matter expert, uh, process as part, uh, whether you are the sponsor, whether you are the customer, whether you are the, you are working as um, a project team member, you are, um, you are a, a stakeholder in that project. So, and it's very key to understand the people that matters in a project, know the way you, you work with them because project you cannot work in isolation you work with people if you don't understand the people you work with you are going to have a problem there's no two ways about it so that's why um, statistics uh, predict that uh, uh, show that the most of the project fails because of um, lack of proper stakeholder management or lack of understanding of stakeholders so if you can understand your stakeholder very well these people for instance the, the the product owner or the sponsor if you understand the product owner or the sponsor very well the pro the, the, the sponsor will tell you the requirements that is needed but if you don't understand the stakeholder it's, it's going to be very difficult for you to to gather the the necessary requirement. Stakeholder management is the process of forming, managing, and maintaining constructive relationship by ensuring expectations have been achieved and end result meets quality expectation of the stake stakeholder or end user. Stakeholder management ensures that key stakeholders are kept satisfied throughout the project life cycle. So it's not a one-off thing. You can say that I've done my stakeholder management and that's it. You can start a, a, the process, but it doesn't end till the project ends because you keep on submitting reports on a weekly basis. You submit a project status report to who stakeholder. You get value, every process you take, every requirement, every deliverable get validated. Who validates all those requirements? Uh, all those um, deliverable stakeholders. You are team members, you need to understand them. The end users, you need to understand them. They need to know what is going on. If you are developing, starting to solve a, a, a problem within an existing process. For instance, you are doing a process improvement. Some people are using that process already. So you need to carry them along to understand that they are, the problem they are having using that particular uh, process or using that part, the particular product to know their pain points, where they are struggling, their challenges using that um, product for you to really understand the kind of solution you are going to deploy. So that's why you need to understand everybody. 
totally before you can um, deploy uh, an effective project management. Okay. Importance of getting um, importance of stakeholder management. Getting the opinion of your highly influential and powerful stakeholders will enable you to shape and define your projects from the onset. Stakeholder buy-in can improve the quality of your projects. What is stakeholder buy-in? Buy-in is, we can call it um, lobbying, but that doesn't mean um, giving out brown envelope or something like that. Lobbying mean is trying to woo the stakeholder to support you. You can do that by trying to be transparent, carrying the stakeholder along engaging the stakeholder very often, making sure that the stakeholder don't feel neglected. This is the way you can buy stakeholder in to support you. And once you, you, you buy a stakeholder, a stakeholder in, it's going to help you because there are some things you don't know that the stakeholder wants you to know and the stakeholder will make it easy for you to understand it. Because you, you, now we are working with the stakeholder not only as a stakeholder, but as a friend. Stakeholders completely understand your objective and benefits, benefits of your project and can help improve uh, support. So they understand what they want. They understand this project and they have all it takes to help you improve, even some other stakeholders that tend to be um, difficult. They can help you to get them by your side. So you need to work hard to win your stakeholders. It's the politics we play in project management. Stakeholders help identify the key blockers in your project so you can win them over. So all these blockers, blockers mean challenges within your project. These are what you can achieve by understanding your stakeholders very well. So now we've seen the importance of stakeholder, then how do we do this stakeholder? How do we conduct um, or start our stakeholder management. The first thing is to develop a list of stakeholders. <laughs> Identify mutuality. How each stakeholder is important to the project. Each stakeholder's expectation stakeholders requirement in the project. Then categorize stakeholders in terms of their influence and their power. What is their relationship to the company or the organization? Are the stakeholders internal or are they external? These are the key factors. the key steps you need to take in order to uh, kickstart your stakeholder management. So I say you are, this is when you kickstart stakeholder management, then it's going to be a, con a continuous process. Please mute yourself. So these are how you identify the key points, the key areas in your stakeholder management. Then you do the prioritization. After identifying stakeholders, 
The next thing is to prioritize uh, the stakeholders. Rate and rank stakeholders in terms of the following. The power the stakeholders have. Do they have enough power to halt or influence the project? Proximity. What is their involvement level within this project? You need to understand their involvement level. Urgency. How urgent is your project to the stakeholder? These are the key areas. Then you need to um, look at the, the, the communication strategy. Looking, you must develop a communication plan on how to communicate every stakeholder. Don't use your communication plan for stakeholder A to communicate stakeholder B. You must have a communication plan for every stakeholder. You know how to engage them. How often do you communicate with them? What are the methods of communication? Engagement can be weekly reports. If it's a weekly report that you engage the stakeholder, make sure you, because some stakeholder might not like you calling them every day, uh, follow a plan, engage them with your plan. You must have the interpersonal skills needed to, to communicate with all these stakeholders. These are the, the soft skills needed in project management. You must apply them. So the soft skills, we are going to come to the soft skills we need in a project management later as we uh, progress. You must know the method of uh, meeting. How do you have meeting? Is it a um, conventional way of meeting in the office? Is it a um, virtual meeting? After the meeting, you need to communicate the, the, the minutes of the meeting for the stakeholders to validate, making sure that whatever uh, the input of the meeting is what is being um, uh, gathered whichever data that has been imputed within the meeting is very important. After, after uh, meeting with the stakeholder, you need to follow up. You need to have follow-up activities. You must know how to follow up activities. And then you need to check the level of awareness. Are the stakeholders aware of various things that are happening within the project? If they are not aware, then you must have a plan to bridge the gap, to make sure that they are supposed to be aware. But if, because the stakeholder is supposed to be aware of events and they are not aware, they are not going to be happy. These are the simple key process of. Uh, starting a managing stakeholder. But with all this, you can't just achieve this like this by just, you need action, you need tools, you need uh, methodologies, you need techniques to achieve this, concrete techniques. And this is going to take us to the tools and techniques we are going to use to manage these stakeholders. How you can be applying all these tools, whichever tool you want to use, how you can apply these tools, and then you give you results. It will show you, give you results, it will give you uh, key performance indicators, knowing when you are, you are not performing and when you are performing. So that is the next thing we are going to do. And to do a thorough stakeholder management, these are the tools. These are the tools 
I'm using and uh, the most popular tools in the market for project management when it comes to stakeholder management. We have stakeholder analysis and we have documents we, we need to use for our stakeholder analysis. So we are going to look at these documents and how to do stakeholder analysis. Then we have power grid, stakeholder power grid. We call it power metrics. You can hear any, it can be power metrics, you can be power, it depends on the name, but the end point is that is a, is, um, a tool to understand stakeholders' power within a project and then communicate stakeholders based on their power and their influence. We have communication plan. Communication plan is very important because it will help you to bridge the communication gap. When there is gap in communication in projects, problem starts from there. So we need to understand how to use this communication plan to bridge gap in stakeholder management. Then we have RACI, RACI metrics. RACI will help us to uh, understand your, responsi uh, your responsibilities, your account accountabilities, who need to be consulted and who, who need to be informed. And even the project team members need to understand their own responsibilities, their accountab accountabilities, who need, who, whom they need, to be cons uh, they need to consult and whom they need to inform. So when you plan all this very well, before you start the project, then you know what you are doing at every point in it because everything is organized. When, when you look at your tool, your tool will be directing you on the next step to take. You know what to do at every point in time. But if you don't have all these tools, you might not know what to do. You are going to get confused. When you're under pressure, you won't know what to do. And that's how you start sinking in a project where your project starts suffering. So, what is stakeholder analysis? Stakeholder analysis involves identifying and analyzing the stakeholders that are likely to affect or be affected by a particular project activity. Then planning to communicate and engage with them. It is used in project management to develop engagement and cooperation between project team and the project um, stakeholders. Someone is raising hand. So that is stakeholder analysis. It helps you to analyze all the stakeholders, try to understand their, their powers, try to understand their influence, try to understand them as a human being, because we're all human beings. You try to understand what goes for them and what doesn't go for them. And when you understand them very well, you get during the analysis, you are getting data, you are generating data about the stakeholder, how you are going to manage the stakeholder. And then after the analysis, you must have developed a document you are going to use, a workable document that will help you to manage your, your project smoothly. So how do we conduct stakeholder analysis? 
to conduct statehood analysis, the first thing is to invite the project team and the key representative from the management. Explain the purpose for conducting stakeholder analysis. Brainstorm the individuals and group who may have a stake in the project or the change effort. Plot each individual or group on the power interest metrics. Saw them by the power they have and by their interest in the project or the change initiative. Identify the gaps between the current and the desired involvement level. And then create a communication plan to manage the ongoing communication with the stakeholder. It might sound so simple, but it is it's not simple at all if you don't follow it um, judiciously. This is a big effort. But if you have the right tools, it's not going to be difficult. If you know what you are doing, if you, if you, are, if you are prepared for this job, then it's not, not going to be difficult for you at all. So how do you identify the project team members the, and know who are the stakeholders? It's a very difficult process as a project manager. But you can do it. The first thing you need to do is first understand the organization stakeholders, because once you understand the organization stakeholders, most of these stakeholders within your project team are going to come from the organization. Although some might come outside the organization, these are going to be the external stakeholders. But first understand the organization stakeholders to identify who is in and who is not, um, who is who within the organization. You can do that by demanding for the, the organization charts. So you know who and who is who and how they are related, how they, they are related to your project. Because you might be needing them, not, not them needing you. So you need to look out for them. So this is organization stakeholder. Who are they? Number one is the employees. We have senior executives. We have shareholders. We have customers. We have suppliers and contractors. And we have end users. We have families of employees. They are stakeholders of that organization. If you are working in a particular organization, your wife is a stakeholder to that organization because your wife might affect you or your children might affect you in one way or the other that will affect your job. So we have investors as well. We have lenders. We have partners, we have unions and regulators, trade unions. If you are a teacher, union of teachers can influence you. Like if you are a lecturer, academic union like ASU, you see what's going on. They are, you, they, are, they can, like uh, ASU is now uh, affecting Nigerian universities, you can see how union can be a, a powerful stakeholder within an organization. We have media. Media can put a negative picture within your, 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 your business. 
government, all of us knows the impact of government is playing within a company. So these are the stakeholders. Like I said, the first thing is to identify. So you are in the process of identification. So when you identify the organization stakeholders, these are not uh, all. Of, all these organizations, they are not your project stakeholders, but this will help you to drill down to the project stakeholders. Because some of the people within this organization are going to make it within your project stakeholders. So let's look at the project um, stakeholders. So looking at the diagram, we have the project leader. The project leader is you the project manager, you are the project leader. Then you have project team members. We have process owners. Process owners, they are the subject matter expert. They have expert knowledge about any particular process in the company or the organization. Then people who work on the process. They might not be process owners, but they are end users of this process. Customers of the process. We have customers who use a particular process, uh, a particular process output. They are stakeholders within the, uh, the project. You need to understand them as well. Then you have suppliers of the process. Suppliers might be the vendors within this particular process. Then you have operations managers. So these are key organizational stakeholders. They are now coming into this project, like uh, operations managers. We have finance managers. They are key members of the organization, they are coming in. We have procurement manager. We have HR training manager. Then we have performance manager. We have senior executives. These are all stakeholders. They manage the resources, the budget, they help you to manage understand the, the resources you need, everything you need about this project, these people will help you to understand it. These people will help you to deploy this project within the time frame and within the budget. So you need to work with them. You need to engage them as often as you can. So this is how with this kind of plot you can identify all the stakeholders you need within the project so that is how to um, identify your stakeholders so let's look at it from this way look at it let's itemize the activity on how to do this so if for instance you are managing a project how are you going to do it we'll use this itemization step by step and you then create a perfect stakeholder analysis okay number one we brainstorm individuals and group who may have in uh, a stake in the project we saw them by their power and their interest. Three, we plot them on power interest methods. Four, we identify the gap between the current states and the de desired involvement level. And then we create a plan for ongoing communication. So you can manage your stakeholders in this, within this 
five stages. If you follow it sequentially, you are going to get a good result. But if you miss any of this uh, particular uh, sequence, you might have a problem. So this is how the best practice in managing stakeholders using this sequence is very clear. So how do we brainstorm the brainstorming? For instance, now we are managing a project and now as a team, uh, as a project manager, you want to start managing your project. What do you do? Let's look at the number one brainstorm individuals and group. Now, this is how we brainstorm them. The first thing is to identify stakeholders using affinity diagram and group them into logical categories. So as we are brainstorming them, we are categorizing them within this, <clears throat> within this affinity diagram. So now you see this is the project itself. And this is the project um, leader. And that is you, the project manager. This is the project team members. All everybody here, they are all stakeholders within this project. So now this is the project. This is all the executive within the within the organization that are going to affect this project. We have senior managers. Senior managers within the role or within the 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 the, 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 the projects we are, we, are, we are working on. For instance, if you are trying to deploy a CRM solution, customer relationship management solution, then we have a, CR, a customer relationship manager or senior manager. They must be part of this project. If you are trying to work on payment system within a, um, an organization, they're having problem within their payment system and you are trying to deploy another payment, maybe a payment gateway, because it's, it's about finance, about the revenue collection, and then finance manager must be involved from the organization. So these are where the senior manager, HIDAL, finance, HR, this is, these are them. Then we have process owners. Process owners, this is within the group they fall in. Process owners are the subject matter experts. These are the people that knows how to use that particular pro, um, that solution or that process. If you like, uh, for instance, we are talking about uh, customer relationship management. A customer relationship management is is a software. If a company is using it, the company must have an administrator managing that soft, uh, software or customer relationship management um, application. So that is the process owner. He, the person, he or she owns that particular process. So he know if the person have got an expert knowledge on that process. So he must be part of this project. Then we have other people who work on the, the process. Like we say that the, the, the process owner might be is the, maybe the, the, the administrator. Then we have other people using that customer's relationship like um, the sales rep or the marketing team that are using that all the time to analyze customers' information all the time. So they are the people, the other people that need to be 
uh, part of this uh, uh, part of this project because this project have got something to do with finance. The finance team must be there because you need somebody need to approve the cost and the revenue. So these are other people you might consider because when you want to make procurement and the rest of them, these are the people that are, might affect your project. Then we have so many other internal stakeholders, depending on the nature of the project we are. So that's how you group them. And as you group them, this will help you to know the communication plan you are going to develop to come because the, the same communication you use to communicate with your project team members is not going to be the same communication you are going to use for finance managers or other uh, internal stakeholders. And at the end of the day, we have customers. Olusegun, you are raising your hand. Hello. Okay, maybe you don't know your hand is up. Then after this uh um... hello hello hi yeah i'm sorry probably it was the network so i wanted to actually ask the difference between product owner process owner and uh, project sponsor bro you say product owner product owner process owner and project sponsor okay these um well agile methodology the pro the the project the product uh, project sponsor is the person that initiates that particular project. He can be a client or he can be a senior manager, but he is the person that brings uh, about this change, he initiate the change. He moves emotion for this change within the organization before it's uh, adopted. Maybe within his organization, it can be a finance director that want to change any activity or the method of uh, or improve on the, the general um, operations process. He is the owner, he's the sponsor. Then a project, a, a product owner. <clears throat> is the person, a product owner is not uh, in a conventional, we don't have project uh, product owner in a conventional project setting like waterfall. Product owner is only within agile scrum environment. And within that agile scrum environment, the product owner sounds as times as the, the, the project manager because he collects the requirements. He's a high level uh, business analyst. He collects the requirements from the, uh, the sponsor and then work on the requirements, groom the requirements, design the solution, and then work with the development team. That is the developers. And then deploy. he manages this, the product. And then he reports back to the, uh, the product, uh, the project, um, uh, the project sponsor. So he's a gap between the project team, the, between the product team, that is the project team, and the, the stakeholders. So the issue of project product owner, these are activities were are coming later within this project, but we are just jumping gone. 
but it's not here. I have to explain it because ask the question, but we are coming in details to, 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 to look at all those things in details within agile environments. Then the process owner, just like I said, is the person that have expert knowledge about the process. He might not be part of the project um, uh, development team. Just like I said, he can be an administrator of that particular software solution, like um, CRM or enterprise resource uh, planning. So this is where uh, they, they fall in. So they, they know that particular software very well. They have been using that software for a long time. So if you are doing, if you have a kind of um, want to improve on that particular process, he's the person to, uh, to be consulted in order to get expert information about how the process is running and then understand the area of uh, improvement within that process. I don't know if, um, if, if you are getting my clarification. That's clear. At least I was able to know that now that the product owner and the project manager are same in some context. That's right. Yeah, yeah they, are, they are similar, but you know, they are, they, are, they, are not, they are not being used within, once you, you step into agile methodology, then the world, project manager will disappear. Do you understand what I mean? So yes. If you are working within agile environment, what we have within agile environment is the product owner, product owner. which is the leader. Okay. He's the leader in that project environment. And then we have Scrum Master. Hmm. Scrum Master is another person, is the leader on his own, helping to solve problems, but he is working on that product owner because the product owner owns the, the product you are developing. Then we have development team. And then we have stakeholders. Stakeholders are the sponsors. So you will not then hear any word project manager again. Okay. That is agile for you. But if you are working within waterfall environment, that's why we hear so much about the project manager. But all these things change of name and terminologies and um, uh, uh, technical jargons. So let us not um, deviate much within our topic. Our topic is um, identifying our stakeholders using affinity diagram. So when you use the affinity, the affinity diagram to identify stakeholders, just like the way it's looking um, this, um, this way, then the next thing is to then sort these stakeholders based on their power and their interests. So this is what we are going to use. You're going to use a template like this. And then here you write the stakeholder name by name. You write the stakeholder by their position. Their position, I mean position within the organization. Because their position within the organization might not be their position within the project. So that's why you write position within the organization and then you write their position within the project. That is project rule. Then we indicate the kind of power they have. Is it high or low? You raise the high power, you indicate their power here, high power. So with this, 
we indicate their level of awareness within the project. Then here, based on their interaction with them so far, you indicate their interest. Are they interested or are they, are they not showing interest? You indicate their level of interest. Then here, you indicate their level of um, supportiveness. How are they supporting you within the project? But the main thing here is to capture the power and interest first. Group them within their, their power and interest. And to do this, we use power grid to further plot them within their power and the interest. That's we call it power grid. So this is the way power grid looks like. So that is the third step. You classify them using power grid. Looking at this power grid, we have some stakeholders here. We call them context setter. Then we have some stakeholders here. We call them key players. We have some stakeholders here. We call them the crowd. And we have some stakeholders here we call them the defenders. So once you plot them here, where they, where they belong, that is when the analysis will begin. You'll be using this to know how to interact with the stakeholder. Like under this context setter, you, when you look at this power grid, you can see here, from the here, these two boxes are high power, and these two boxes below are low powered stakeholders. So we have two boxes, two power, high powered stakeholders here content setter and key players. They are the high powered stakeholders. And the low powered stakeholders are the crowd and the defenders. That is the way they are power. You now, any stakeholder that you plot within this area, they are very high powered stakeholders. These are people that can destroy your project or even destroy you within the project. So you need to know how to manage them. So how do you manage this kind of people? Okay, looking at them again, you need to understand their interests as well. You look at their interests, look at interests here. By the left, you see low interest. These two boxes, both crowd and contest setter are low interest. These people don't have interest in this project. But defenders and key players, these people have interest in this, um, in this uh, project. They have high interest. So this is high interest, low interest. These two boxes is high interest, and these two boxes are low interest. These two boxes up here are high power, and these two boxes down here are low uh, powers. So that's how you, 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 you group them using this power grid. Then how do you manage stakeholders? based on this. Some of these stakeholders within this context setter does have high power and low interest. These people are the, they are the most dangerous stakeholders. These people might be representing the law. For instance, if I may use a construction project, if you are using this to manage construction project, these people, this is where the, the health and safety officers belongs to. They have high power and they don't care. They can close the site for six months and they don't care. So 
in order to make sure that uh, you don't have any problem with these kind of people that will destroy your projects is to understand them. When you understand them, you satisfy their need. That is the only way to get away with this kind of stakeholders. How do you understand them? To understand them, these people are representing the law. Understand what the law said about the kind of project you are managing. If you are managing a, 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 it's an IT project where you manage a lot of data, then you need to know that uh, these people are the data protection officers. You need to understand what the, the powers, the law say like, uh, you need to understand the GDPR very well to understand what the, 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 the law say about data protection. If you are managing a construction pro, uh, project, you need to understand what the law say about safety and hazard uh, substances within a construction site and working safe within a construction site. You need to make sure that you apply all those things very well. That is the only way you can uh, satisfy this kind of uh, stakeholders within construction environment. These people can equally be the councils, local council authorities. So you need to understand them. They work closely. They can write a memo and just, just a little memo and signature. They will bring their project to a halt. So that is them, the contest setters or the high powered, low interest stakeholders. Then we come to key players. The key players are the high power and high interest stakeholders. These people in green, in green um, t-shirts. They are high power, high interest. They are the project sponsors. They want these projects to, to succeed. They have in high interest in these projects because they are, they've, um, they've uh, um, contributed a lot within these projects. So they want these projects. If the project becomes a success, they are taking the, the, um, the, the, the profits or the sources, they are happy when the project, so you need to engage them to understand them, engage them and manage them actively. You develop a good relationship with them to understand the requirements they, they have for this project, to understand the scope very well. They are the people that will help you to, to know, they know the vision, they know the aims and objectives of this project. So constantly engage them. Don't um uh stay away from them for a too, for too long try to have a good communication plan on how to meet them maybe on weekly basis then we come down to these people we call the crowd this crowd here they can see here them here they don't have power and they don't have they don't even have power and they don't have interest they are not interested in this project and they don't have any power in this project let okay. me use let me use construction projects as well these people that we call crowd here they are the operatives they are the people like the electricians, the plumbers, the technicians. You need to monitor them to make sure that they are doing their job as a project manager. If this project is meant to last for six months, these people call the crowd, we pray for this project to last for two years so that they will have job. That is what matters to them that they have job. They are going to work every day. If the, if the project goes down, 
they don't know. They don't care. The next thing is that they moved to another project where they will be doing their, 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 their operative jobs. So you make sure that they are doing their job very well within the best practice. They are meeting the requirements. If you are working in an um, IT project, some of these people can be the developers. They don't care. All they know is that uh, they have a job. So if you, are, if, if you are working with them, you make sure that there is minimum bug within the, 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 develop, the, the, the software they are developing. Make sure you monitor them. They do, they, they, they do whatever they need to do. They need proper monitoring. Because uh, they perform activity. Most of these uh, deliverables, they are the people that will be helping in deploying some of these deliverables. And if they are not doing their job very well, it's going to affect this project. So you need to constantly monitor them. Then we have these uh, defenders. Defenders here, they have high interest in this project, but the issue is that uh, they don't have enough power to make any contribution in this project. So these people we call defenders, they are the end users of this project. For instance, IT projects, if you are trying to deploy, let me continue to use CRM solution. The end result of that CRM solution, they are the people going to use it because they are going to be using this on daily basis, maybe as a, a customer support officer or a sales rep using CRM on daily basis. They are interested because they want to know the outcome because this is what they are going to be using on a daily basis. It's just like um, if you are doing improvements, it's just like you are, in, you are renovating their, 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 their house. For instance, just like um, you are trying to improve your son's uh, bedroom, your son's room. They are going to be very happy. They want to know the next thing. Although they don't have power, they don't have money to contribute, but they are very, very have high interest in the outcome of that uh, the room we are decorating for them. So that is how it looks within the organization. They are going to use that uh, process. You are improving, so they are very, very interested to know the outcome. So you have to consider them and keep them informed on what is going on. They might not only be. Um, the end users, internal end user. They can be customers as well. For instance, Microsoft, um, Facebook. If you are following Facebook very well, you know that the owner of Facebook, which is the, pro the product owner, Mark Zuckerberg, once in a while, Mark will come to the Facebook to tell us about uh, what is going on, about the project that is going on, for instance, you come and update us about what they are doing with um, with WhatsApp, the features they are they they were uh, integrated that they are going to really they are in testing stage and what uh, we we are going to achieve after that. And we the end users we start commenting either we are praising him or we are saying we don't want this. There are times Mark will come and tell us about uh, metaverse, the stage they are in metaverse. We we'll start commenting. So we are, we don't have power to change, to tell Mark stop. But they're always updating us because we are the people that are going to use that product after not Mark is, they are not, we are the people that are going to use. That's why we, we, we need to be informed. Although we don't have power, but we are highly interested in everything that's going on in Facebook. So that is um, how this, um how it works so the key players are um 
the key players should be closely involved in all project activities and nothing should come as a surprise to them. Examples of uh, stakeholders can be operations managers and some of them subject matter experts. Then content center are senior stakeholders who take critical decision and reach to more powerful stakeholders. They should be kept informed and satisfied to maintain their support. Defenders have little power, but are highly interested in the uh, project outcome. They should be kept informed to maintain their interest. Examples of such stakeholders are people who will apply the improved process. Crowd have little power and little interest in the project. So they don't require a great deal of uh, consideration. Consider them occasionally with them about the important issues and results. So these are how you, you manage these stakeholders based on their interest and their power. So now you have uh, identified their power and identified their interest. The next thing is to um, to process um, to produce a communication plan uh, uh, to do a gap analysis. To, to look at their level of um, involvement and make sure that they are at the right place they are supposed to be. So what this means is that after plotting them, you look for the stakeholders looking at where they are, this is their current state. You find out that some of them are not aware. Some of them are unaware. Some of them are aware, some of them are interested, some of them are not uh, are supportive. Like this, you can see here, under interest is not ticked because they are not interested. Under supportiveness, you can see is not ticked because they are not supporting you. So, but they are aware, this particular stakeholder is aware of what we are doing, but the stakeholder is um, is not supporting, and is not. It doesn't um, feel interested. So what do you do? You look at the desired um, state where you want this. You want every stakeholder to um, to show interest, and then you want to get support of every stakeholder. So you have to work hard to get their support and get their interest uh, or get, their, get them to be aware if they are not aware of uh, what is going on. So that is how you do a gap analysis within um, stakeholder management or, or stakeholder analysis. You do a gap analysis to cover um, find out their, their, their current state or their current involvement and their desired involvement and then fill in the gap. And after then, the next thing you need to do is to plan a communication plan, create a communication plan to manage the ongoing communication. And to do that, you have to write the stakeholders name here. You write their contact information here. Then you decide the method of communication. If the stakeholder is the, is the person that uh, requires email, you have to state that you use email to communicate the stakeholder and you put their email here. That, that is the, the method of communication. If the stakeholder, is a phone that you need to communicate, you state the method of communication for. If the stakeholder is the kind that you don't need to contact with a WhatsApp email or WhatsApp call, you don't do that. 
then you need to state whom the stakeholder uh, is, their role. Then how often do you communicate this stakeholder? This can be weekly basis. If a stakeholder that you communicate on weekly basis by submit, submitting your, your weekly reports via email, then you have to put email here. And at the, every, at the end of the week, you submit your weekly report, maybe a project status report to the stakeholder. And when you get a feedback, you log in the feedback you get from the stakeholder here. So yeah, it's either uh, after viewing your, your report, the stakeholder said that he's not happy with your report. You need to indicate that the stakeholder is not happy with your report. But if he's happy, approved, maybe you submitted the deliverable. If the stakeholder have approved the deliverable, you need to share um, to indicate the kind of um, feedback you receive from the stakeholder. That is how you, you use the communication communication plan to manage them as the project goes on because it's an ongoing process. So you continue every act, every communication you log in, every communication you log in. We log in the feedback. So that is the, the, these key stages in um, stakeholder management or stakeholder analysis. Then these are the documents we are going to be using. These are the way they are our templates. That's how our templates we are going to be using um, after even after this course during our uh, work experience. This is the kind of stakeholder analysis documents we are going to be using. Here, we, this is a rules and involvement worksheet. Here you put the stakeholder, stakeholder name, position, project rule, power, awareness, interest, and supportiveness. <clears throat> then here is the involvement planning worksheet. If this is the stakeholder, then you write uh, the, the current uh, involvement and the desired involvement. Then we have a communication plan here. The communication plan is uh, the stakeholder method of communication, whom, how often, telephone, email, and the feedback log. So uh, I will provide this template at the end of this uh, this uh, at the end of this training because we are going to be using it for uh, for your job. So this is how we do it. So once you have this kind of template, it's going to be very easy for you to do your stakeholder analysis. You don't need to start uh, having headache because. Uh, you want to do stakeholder analysis. All this thing is organized and will help you to document everything you need to do. So this is it. And um, if you have question, let's take um, some, um, let me respond to your question before we can proceed. I have a, uh, you see the same thing, but um, is a bit of um, case study about stakeholder analysis. So, but let me take your question before we proceed to that. Okay. I move to the case study as we don't have questions. So looking at this case study, we're now trying to um, fill in this uh, document, this um, role and involvement worksheet. That is this document. And here you can see the stakeholder's name is um, this particular stakeholder is Adam. This is Sunny. This is uh, Pretos, but this is uh, 
Zachariah. And this is procurement, and this is uh, Sarah. Then the position here is uh, um, Adam is a finance manager, but his role in this project is finance advisor. So he's not answering, not a finance manager within the, the project. So you can see the, pro, the, the, the position in the organization is not the same thing within the position in the uh, project. And Adam have got high power within this project. So Adam is a, um, a high power, the, a stakeholder and then the level of awareness somehow aware and the uh, interest you can say no it doesn't show it's not showing interest me because it's not um doesn't like what the the project manager is doing and then the level of supportiveness you can see here is resistance it's not supporting the project manager and that's why the level of interest here is the same because he's a resistance stakeholder. So maybe Adam have indicated, have uh, seen that the project manager is not uh, prudent as a finance uh, advisor. Maybe he's not prudent on the way um, he's using the project, he's spending money on that project. So you have uh, seen that maybe he's not happy. Maybe that's why he's not uh, supporting. And that's why, that's how to plot all these other stakeholders after your analysis. You plot them either resistance. So this is how you plot them. I will not be taking them one by one because of time. So be just to show you first class how you can actually plot them and know how to, the kind of wording you use. So it's not a, a big uh, issue. So now you've uh, identified these stakeholders, their, their, their power and their interest. Now you come over here to plot them in this, um, to plot them within this uh, power grid. And within this power grid here, you can see that uh, the Adam that is not, um, is a high powered stakeholder here and he doesn't have interest. You know, so that's why he's here. He's a high power, low interest. So you don't care. All you can, you can just end it because he's not the the owner of this. Uh, he, he, he's not uh, part of the initiate uh, the people that initiated this project. Although he's part of the financing that releases releasing the fund, but he doesn't have interest in this project. So then you have Zachariah here. Zachariah and Sammy have high interest. So let's see where they are. Zachariah here. Let's see Zachariah here. Zachariah is the COO, that is Chief Operating Officer. That is Zachariah here. He's the Chief Operating Officer. And you can see that he's the project sponsor. That's why Zach Zachariah have got high power and uh, high interest. He's very interested and you can see he's being supportive because he wants this project to be a success. So that's why if you come here, Zachariah is here. He's the sponsor of this project and uh, he's got high power in this project because he's the sponsor. And uh, he's got high interest because he's the sponsor. So uh, he's doing everything to support this project. So if you're a project manager, you keep engaging him very often, as uh, often as you can. And this particular Adam that is not uh, supportive, you need to understand what Adam, you need to understand how to manage uh, uh, finance. Maybe you didn't do a good uh, cost um, analysis. So you need to understand the way the organization 
do their cost analysis. Maybe the, the time the time you, you presented their cost analysis for this project, Adam didn't like it. So you need to understand the way to do it. Under this, Adam is now a law in a way within this organization because he's working within the finance. Maybe they have a particular template on how they do, and they are not following the best approach. So you need to understand what he, um, Adam needs and uh, follow that process. So as you can see here, these are the technicians. They don't have power. They can be the developers. They don't have power. And they are not interested. You need to monitor them. You can see here, these are the end users. Like uh, this can be uh, sales supervisors and the operators using that particular end product. So you need to um, consider them and get, let them know about what is going on. So this is um this is it that is the the power and interest he uh, plotted plotted all these stakeholders based on their power and interest so now it's time for you to get your support and this is what the major thing you are going to be looking at as a project manager you need support you need the uh, stakeholders to support you so you can see these people, when you see resistance, resistance is being indicated with red color. Any stakeholder that is beaming red color is a stakeholder that is not supporting you. So this is where you, uh, you, you, you know whether you are in trouble or, in, or not in terms of stakeholder management. If all these stakeholders all of a sudden turn to red, then you know there is a problem for you. But you can see some of them are support. Even here, Sunny is not even supporting you. And Sunny have high interest in this project. So you can see all you need to do is to work so hard to make sure that all of them turns green. Everybody is support. It's going to be diff difficult, but you work as you work hard to, to more especially the people at the top, which is the high powered stakeholders. You try to, to make sure that you, you buy in this Adam to start supporting you. Once you buy Adam to start supporting you and buy Sami to start supporting you, then your project will become very, very uh, healthy. But at this point, this project is not healthy because these two key stakeholders are not supporting you. That their levels of support is red. They are resistant. They are not even neutral. They are resistant. But this procurement is not new. It's not supporting. It's not. It's just lukewarm. You don't care about what's going on. But you need to make sure you get all of them to be supporting you, and that is um, a good uh, stakeholder um, management. So that's all about stakeholder analysis. So that is a stakeholder analysis. Then the next thing we have here is uh, under stakeholder management is um, racing metrics. Racing metrics, racing stands for responsible, accountable, consulted, and uh, informed. Racing metrics is an effective way to define roles and responsibilities of various stakeholders towards achieving a common goal. It brings clarity to the roles people play within a project. So, that is it that they are responsible, accountable, consulted, and uh, informed. So 
With this, every stakeholder, both uh, stakeholders and team members, they know what they are doing, what they are responsible, their responsibilities, and they know who is accountable. This refers to the person who ensures that the work is completed on time and on budget. So most of the time, you, the project manager, is accountable. You make sure that they do their work. And the responsible is the person that is performing that task, perform and the producing deliverables. And consulted is the person, for instance, are you, are you responsible, you are working on a, a task and you don't have enough expert knowledge, you need to consult to get more information. These are subject matter experts, you need to consult them. Resymmetrics will help you to find out this subject matter expert when you are doing your job to consult them. Some people need to get to be informed so you need to know those that need to be informed in every decision you are taking. They might not be contributing, but they need to know what you are doing. They will have so many high level stakeholders. When you are using um, tools like um, Basecamp, there are some stakeholders you, you add within the project. They don't add, they don't make any input. They don't do anything, but they need to, to know everything that is going on within the project. So these are the people you need to inform. And to inform them, you make sure that any deliverable, any decision, they, they get a, a notice or they get a, a push notification about any, everything that is going on. They have access to documents pertaining that project. They can be CEOs. They might not come to start uh, asking you or you are not reporting to, to them. But whenever they need to know what's going on, they don't need to start asking you to bring documents. They just log in and see what you are doing. So how do we create um, racing metrics? To create a racing metrics, with your team, clearly explain the purpose of creating a racing, a racing, a racing matrix is for them to understand their roles and their responsibilities so that we won't be having clash of interest and to know whom will be holding accountable or who is responsible if anything goes wrong. Because at times if, if rules are not defined, You'll be seeing some people doing overlapping, doing other people's job. They have not finished their own and they want to overlap and do other people's job. Uh, you we'll see people clashing all the time. But when it's defined using racism, everybody knows their lane. They know what they are doing. So when you clearly explain the purpose, identify stakeholders who need to be involved and the main activity that they need to perform. Use a flip chart or a whiteboard to construct a two dimension, dimensional metrics. Enter the activity in the left column, that is activity here in the left column, and the person or the, the role within the right um, column or the right uh, row of the metrics. For each activity, identify the responsible person the accountable person, uh, the, con the person to be consulted, and the person to be informed. Discuss the racing metric with key stakeholders to verify their accuracy. When you sorted it out, you need to um, verify the accuracy, making sure that the way you plotted it is the way that role is supposed to be, that there is no, we say, before you start using them. So this is how you create Resymmetries. I either you are working as a, a project manager or as a business analyst. You need to know how to use this resim. It's very very important to help you to know what you are what you'll be doing. You don't need to be asking so much questions. You'll be consulting when you look at your resim. You know what to do. So this is um res. This is activity and this is um. Person. So activity are the, the left and the, um, the role will be on top. That's how you, 
you you plot your RACI. And this is an um, example of a RACI method, how RACI is supposed to be. Now, using this particular RACI matrix, looking at the activities, these are what they are supposed to be doing. Activities are tax and uh, deliverables. That is activities and tax and deliverables. So under these activities, we have customer complaint reduction. Somebody is in charge, should be in charge for customer complaint reduction within this project. Change over time reduction. Change over time reduction line two. That's a um, uh, support line. Uh, chemical usage reduction. All oh, these are activities. Uh, machine setup time reduction. Spoilage reduction, spoilage reduction to uh, four, line four. Machine tool, uh, machine tooling consumption, line three. So this is all the um, activities. And you can see that this is within manufacturing environment. So, and then this is the the rules and persons. So under here, you see who is accountable. You can see that this is uh, under this particular, Adam is accountable. Adam makes sure that you do this job and you perform it within the allocated time and within the budget. And then who is uh, responsible? Let's look at who is responsible. Responsible is this, um, orange color. Looking at this metric, you can see that Harvey is responsible. And looking at here, we see that Adam is uh, accountable. And consulted, looking at consulted here, you see that Peter, if you're having a problem doing this, you need to consult Peter for an expert knowledge. You can equally consult uh, Zakaria for an expert knowledge. But Sarah, you need to inform Sarah. Sarah needs to know what is, <coughs> what is going on within this uh, particular deliverable. And this approach you use, it does how you use to, to, to analyze all the other activities. So there are so many ways you can do RACI um, metrics. This are other, another sample. Is um, project tasks and this is uh, rules and uh, persons. So this is another RACI matrix. Um, this is activities and this is rules. So you can see where there is, you can use, um, we have a template for this. We, we, we use that can, we are going to share it. So you don't need to go and start developing a template, but if you want to develop a template, that's good. But uh, it's not difficult. You can use a uh, Excel sheet to develop this template. And um, can equally use a uh, Microsoft Word to do the, to develop this template. But this is, you have a, a, a template like this we are using that we are going to be uploading for us to use as soon as we start our work. Uh, placement. So that is RACI matrix. Then the final way we can analyze stakeholders is using personal analysis techniques. So uh, I'm bringing this, I, I don't use this particular. Once I do my, use my, do my stakeholder analysis, and do my racing method is enough for me. But if you want to, to, to be thorough or to do more, or maybe you are working in an organization that this is the approach they use, that's why I'm putting this so that you understand how to do this uh, as well. Personal analysis is a strategic and structural tool for evaluating the external factor that affects the way an organization performs and grows. So this P uh, 
means for political, E means for economic, S here means for social, T means for technology, and uh, L means for legal and the environment. So this will help you to understand stakeholders based on their political um, awareness or political structure or political involvement or how a, a, a political activity can affect the project. For instance, government policies that can cause instability or uncertainties like labor law or corruption level. So if one they change a labor law, it might change the way you are actually um, doing that job or they can a new a new political a new set of politicians are coming and start uh, reviewing um active uh, implementing laws that will change the way everything so you need to understand how political activities will affect your project and then know how to manage that this is economic activities Economy affects the profitability of a business. Example, wealth distribution, spending habits, and the rest of them. So if you, as a project manager, or let me say product owner, you are trying to develop a solution, you must know the kind of people living within that environment that you are developing this. Uh, for instance, if I'm developing food delivery app, and uh, this particular food delivery app, I want to start my operation maybe somewhere in, um, I'm sorry for those who, if you are, if you are living uh, in, within a Jegule area, but everybody knows that uh, uh, those uh, people within a Jegule are low income earners. I'm not trying to talk down on them. You know that, they might not be that uh, the application might not go because people will fit very well before they start uh, going online to pay some money to. But if you this kind of uh, application, if you're somewhere like Lakey, where we have a lot of uh, posh people, they will prefer to relax at home. Some of them will not even cook. They will just make order and they come and deliver their food. So that's how you use this economic. You know the what distribution and spending habits. So we look at the social activities, how social and economic value in which organization you are operating. Understand their lifestyle, uh, lifestyle their social uh, activities, their, their level of education before you, 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 you deploy such solution. So for instance, if you are deploying um, this kind of uh, my solution where people will log in and start receiving their lectures online, this kind of education, you should know the area you are doing this kind of education. That it is a learner where you have learned people. So these are the people that are going to patronize this kind of uh, project. So you need to understand, it will help you know where to cite um this uh, particular project or application learn technology technology car factors is another factors like new technology new skills of so when you are uh, trying to deploy technology maybe if if you want to um looking for 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 clients if you are developing a, trying to develop a software for companies, you must know the kind of companies you are going to look for. Those companies that are very good with um, technological advantage, know the value of new technology, have the skills to understand new technologies. You know their workforce. These are the kind of people you'll be targeting. Then how do law, legal rules, regulation affect our, 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 our project. Like, like I use uh, in construction, I always use health and safety. 
and in IT, like data, we always use the GDPR. How does this kind of uh, regulation, data protection, how are you complying? How is it going to affect? Make sure that you, you know how to comply within this uh, regulation that govern data analysis, data consumption very well before diving into that project. And environment, environmental factors, how does it affect your solution or the, the project you are trying to uh, uh, deploy? For instance, if you are if you're pl planning for a solution where they are constantly talking about climate change, trying to, to reduce emission, for instance, where we are living here in UK and uh, they are no longer the, the, the kind of cars, they're now scrapping um, diesel cars. So, and they are a company now trying to set up uh, a new auto, a diesel automobile. You don't need to come around here because nobody's going to talk to you. So, that is uh, environmental factors. And that's how, after analyzing this, it will give you a good knowledge to know how to manage this project, where to site this project. We can equally use these three to have good understanding on how this uh, works very well. So that is um, like here you see economic, within economic, these are various factors within economic, within social, these are a lot all these within these branches. These are all the factors that is um, uh, causing uh, you can consider like a demography, social welfare, attitude to work, lifestyle, an environmental factor, legal factor, uh, technological factor, and political factor. Mm -hmm. So that is how we do our stakeholder analysis. By the time you do all this, you must have done a very thorough stakeholder analysis. So, and that is where we are ending to this um, class. Um, so if you have a question, I can take your question before we finally end. So do you have any question? Okay. Now we are done with um, tonight's class and um, Yeah, I don't know about, think, I'm thinking of um, um, putting a class tomorrow so that we can cover more. So, so don't be uh, surprised if, I, if, I, if I'm putting a class tomorrow. So, is the, because the, 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 the more we cover, the better, and we'll have time to start sorting other things out. So I say thank you for joining tonight's class. And um, I will see you here this time tomorrow. Yeah.